Step back and see the macro and digest it down to the micro. Trading, investing and geopolitics from macro down to the micro. Welcome to Macronomics. Hey, hey guys, welcome back to Macronomics. Welcome, welcome. I got a quick one guys, I was just reading and... um, the book I was telling you guys about that I'm reading, uh, The Great Depression, Winners and Losers in a Post-Pandemic World by James Rickards. It's uh, one of his, I read one of his um, first books, Currency Wars, and I decided to, you know, I liked it so much that I checked out one of his most recent books. Not pretty good book so far. Overall, though, I would, if you do get it, the first like six, seven chapters is kind of repetitive, but the final ones, oh man, it's gold. It's some good stuff. And that's what I wanted to share with you today. So essentially, he talks about how to... Let me pull it up right here and we can elaborate. Right here, okay? Also, stay with me. Let me take this case off so that we can... good okay let's go so how to beat the market so thus far guys he's essentially talking about how to beat the market some insights um he he points out that a huge portion of the market um upwards of 90 percent of trades are executed by robots and he was saying this is something that you can be aware of and exploit because the robots are trading based off of algorithms that were created by engineers who have never really traded before. You know, a lot of it is keywords as well, maybe what the Fed says. And, you know, historically speaking, the Fed as well as the IMF, they are not, um, they are not good at forecasting uh, news. They're, they're just not. A lot of the information they give is just, it's not helpful. And so they, they might be saying one thing and the market's doing another thing. So... Being aware of that, that robots are a huge portion and you can, so like, let's say you see, like sometimes you might see the dip and I'm talking primarily within the equity markets. You might see a lot of dips and then, you know, uh, there's a buy like porch port. I was in a trade this past, I think it was last week and it was a position I was building on for about a month. I had a couple of stocks and I essentially made 30%, um, we was just bottoming out, and then we had a huge jump up, and so I went ahead and closed out the trade, and the, then <clears throat> it went up a, a whole nother dollar more, and I can't say this is from um, the robots or not, but I definitely know it's correlated, because I mean, yes, you got the robots, but the robots are not acting by itself. You got humans who use the artificial intelligence to execute the trades, so being aware of that as well. Now, a piece of information that correlates to that, guys, is, you know, being okay. Like, you have to be nimble in this market that we're moving into, guys. No matter what asset class that you trade in, you know, the the, the trading of before worked then. We're in a new time, and we can't just depend on, we can't just depend on um, what worked before. We I, In this environment, we have to be nimble. So here's an example. That I personally, like I was just telling you about with porch, right? So let's say, um, historically speaking, wealth managers, they want you to stay in trades. Now, this could be because they're getting paid, you know, commissions based on um, what you're invested into. You also have a camp of people that uh, say just invest in index funds. And that's fine if you can lock up your money for 10 years. You know, a lot of these funds, they might recover. But here's a great example that was um, shared. So let's say you have uh, you have ten thousand dollars, right? And you're invested in an index fund, and it goes up to fifteen thousand, right? So you know, uh, speaking, I'm not speaking, but um, from the example, so you've made five thousand. Now it drops back down to, or you haven't made it unless you close the trade. But okay, it's at fifteen, then it drops to seven, right? You still haven't lost anything because it's still closed, but. I mean, speaking from the trade, if you close it, then you've lost three thousand. Now, here's where this is an example of being nimble, being able to identify the market, 
the parameters, the policies that's being um, uh, proposed, the sentiment of the market, etc. And let's say you get out at instead of fifteen thousand, you got out at fourteen thousand because you was you you identified some of the the policies coming out, you 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 this, the market sentiment as well as the trade, just all the factors you was able to identify. You know what? This is good. I've made you know. Um, I've made like 40%. So I'm going to be okay with that. I'm going to go ahead and take this. And so, boom, you close out. So you've made 4000 Then the trade goes down to seven, and you've identified the market and, and, and all that stuff. But you actually got in at uh, at eight, right? But you identify your, your risk reward, the policy, the sentiment, policy, you know, all that good stuff. And you write it down to 1000 but then it goes back to about uh, 15, right? The 15 range, but you, again, you get out at, at uh, 14. So you made four initially from your trade. So you made four, you got out the trade, that's 4,000. That's profit, you're putting that away. Then you got in at seven, I mean at eight. It went down to, um, to seven, and then it went back to 14. And then you got out. So that's three, that's four, that's seven. You've made total. You've made um, eleven thousand seven. Uh, you know from the um, the second trade and four from the first. You've made eleven thousand, right? Now here's the second scenario: the person who who just stayed in the trade, right? They stayed in the whole time, the whole time, right? They was in at ten. It went up to fifteen. It went back down to about seven. And then went back to about 14, 15, right? They've made about 5,000. You've made 11,000. Now, this is what wealth managers don't tell you. you uh, and there's nothing wrong with indexes, etc. But just putting your money in there and not being aware of the market and everything, that is, the more nimble you, you are, the more you can maneuver, the more you can make. And so that scenario, I hope that conveys what I'm trying to say, because that's at least how I'm going about it. You know, I'm actually in the equities market, right? I have an account in the equities market. And with that, that's why I closed out the porch trade. Yes, it went up a whole nother dollar, right? It was at 270, right? I got in, I was building positions around the 180 to $2.15 range. That whole range, I was just buying up stocks, just setting myself up. And then it jumps to 270, that's a 30% jump. I took that off the table. Why? I wasn't fearful, but I wasn't being greedy either. Take what's given to you. That's why I gave the example where if you get to 14, you don't need to get it at the very top. You know, of course, it might go up. That's okay. You're building on your position. That's another thing that could hinder us, guys, is if we try to make it to the very end and, and snatch up every nickel and dime of what the trade could be. Take what's given to you. So... That's a perfect example that I personally experienced that, you know, I built that position up. I made 30 percent. I let go. Now I'm going to look to build on another position in porch. You know, it's, it's at 380 now, I believe at 380. But I'm also aware of the market, the sentiment and, it, you know, the things that, that's going along with it. I don't need to make all of that. I'm OK with what's given because I'm aware long term. I'm not going to beat myself up. See, now correlating to the currencies because, you know, we're within the currency market that we trade in our currency account. We're not, last week we took three trades. We're not trying to force anything. We're going to let the market come to us, right? We're not going to try and chase it because that's only going to lead to frustration and we're, we're not going to, that's not a good place to be trading at all. So that was, that. I had to dive into that because that, I think that's just so powerful to where we're at right now is being able to stay nimble and so here are some factors that he actually outlines in how to beat the market he says use models that work okay so i guess whatever models that you have that's where personal experience comes in because it's so many different ways to trade guys it's so many methods and algorithms out there that work so many but you are the one implementing so you have to find what works for you you have to practice what that is and identify it and work with it. So those models, don't just buy someone else's models because if you don't understand what it is, it's not going to serve you well. And when it's not working, you won't be able to identify why it's not working. And then you'll be searching for the next one. 
when it's not the algorithm, it's you. So use models that work. Secondly, update continually. So he provides, as far as his time horizon, he says, stick with six months. Instead of trading, you know, six to ten years, look for trades that you can um, update and stay abreast with, you know, up to six months. Now, the trade that I was in recently, it was about a month and a half as far as that, that 30% trade on the uh, account. And, and that's huge, guys, 30%, right? I mean... I, I, I agree with the six month long term, but I also feel if you have a trade where you can set it up, you know, day trading, you know, you, you can make that if you I, I feel like day trading takes up a lot of mental capital. And, you know, me personally, I have other businesses, I got the homestead, you know, I got a lot of stuff that I'm doing. So I like to I like to think long term. So that's the second one. Then diversify asset asset classes. This is a great one because he was saying how. So many people have, hold up, baby. Maybe, you know what? I, this is why I need I need to get back into the office, guys. I got to get my office slash treehouse. It's out of commission right now, but it's getting back together. So um, pretty much, pretty much where we're at now, guys, what... Okay, guys, sorry for that little interruption. Had to readjust. So we was talking about diversification and what that actually means. And essentially, guys, um, so the scenario that's proposed in the book is essentially how some people will be investing in 30 different stocks across 10 different you know, sectors like energy and finance, etc. And the reason why this is not true to diversification is because it's one asset class. See, the equities... It's still an equity. And the whole premise behind this is that even though these are different stocks within the equity market, they all are correlated. So you have certain things within the equity market, the uh, stock market that correlate with each other. And they all, it, it, the market you moves as one in tandem. I mean, yes, you might have slight outliers, et cetera, across the different sectors and whatnot, but the market as a whole moves together. And so... If you're going to truly diversify, move, like me personally, I'm looking to invest into bonds and learn the bond market. You know, the bond market, I believe, is like four times, four to five. I mean, that's probably not an exact number, but I believe it's a lot from my analysis and study. It's a lot bigger than the equities market. And it has uh, it has a bigger political, um, not political, but it has more, more, um, it's a bigger indicator on what's going on within the world of finance, like because it's you know government bonds, etc., and this correlates to politics, etc. So I think it's a lot deeper the bond market, uh, and I don't even think this is. I believe this is a fact, like, and we can research that. But again, I'm learning, so I don't want to say anything's fact. But uh, that's actually what I'm like right now. I'm currently just in the equities and the currency market. That's it. But I look forward to actually diversifying into uh, the bond market as well as private equity. You know, starting to really learn those four. I don't have to be in all of them, but definitely those I want to add bonds and private equity to um, my regime. So true diversification. Make sure you're diversifying, guys. It's try to diversify and not just put all your eggs in one basket. Now also, he talks about acquiring proprietary inside information. So he was saying how you don't have to, you know, um, as far as gathering inside information, you don't have to be under the nose or up the butt of, you know, this company or this source in order to get inside information. You can get it from a newsletter. You can get it from a podcast. You can get it from correlating information. Like me personally, a lot of my information that I digest and correlate is through podcast mediums. You know, a lot of, a lot of it is major news, but it's also correlated. So, you know, I take that information, I just kind of diversify and, and correlate it. So as an example, um, you know, what's happening in Ukraine, uh, it was um, it about a week or two ago, it was support, the Black Sea Turkey was organizing or orchestrating, you know, Ukraine being able to um, ship ship grains away from um, the, what was it, um, 
So essentially, guys, Turkey orchestrate in Ukraine um, uh, um, having some ships take some um, grains out of the port, and it didn't happen. And this correlated with some other news. So then there was some some other news where um, that piece of information, you know, of the uh, the grains leaving or the, the grain ships, I guess, for lack of a better word, they, um, that didn't happen. And so there was some information about, um, so it's just like that, and then piecing, piecing it together with other stuff. But this would be more, more tangible across, you know, financial sectors. So like if this had something to do with oil. Okay, great example. Um, when, when Russia closed down, I believe the Nordstrom pipeline in Germany, for maintenance, you know, there was a lot of speculation and whatnot behind that. And so just being able to correlate information, guys, that's that's very important. You don't need to be, you know, insider to get information. You just got to be able to correlate and have an understanding of the outview. Now, uh, the next one is use market timing. So market timing, he, from his from his view, he talks about essentially beating the crowd. And this just correlates, we're not going to dive too deep, this just simply correlates to being aware of the market, you know, like with the pipeline. Understanding that uh, when the news dropped, right, you don't have to try and trade the news, trade it on a longer term time frame. That's how I correlate. I don't try to trade the news, you know, if, if Germany is closing down the pipeline for uh, maintenance, you know, what does this mean for the next month? And just correlate, it's kind of like, kind of like chess because all the information correlates and you, you're trying to piece it all together and so that's how I look at it. how does it correlate and how can I put it into my thesis and then of course front run the robots so you know if you see you know certain spikes within um, the charts and whatnot understanding what's going on and if it's smart money or dumb money you know he he, he outlines the robots as dumb but so to sum up, guys, we're going to sum up with actually a three-part piece, which is simply right here. So how can you beat the market? To beat the market, you got to be nimble. Got to be nimble. That's the foundation of these three steps. And it's simply, here's the three. Get the forecast right. Get the policy reaction right. And trade ahead of both. So the policy reaction, we was talking about that. Policy could also be news, you know, what, what came out of Germany. I mean, um, Russia with the pipeline, right? That's policy, so to speak. But this, I believe, is correlating to um, uh, financial or uh, fiscal policy or monetary, probably. And, uh, I mean, fiscal or monetary. Fiscal relating to the government and then uh, monetary um, to the money system. Both of them, understanding both policies. And then the market... The market um, getting the forecast right. So just understand the forecast of the market. And so really, guys, if we had to boil down all these steps we just spoke about, we can boil it down to the essentials, which I feel is simply this. Being aware of the market and having an understanding of these moving pieces. You know, there's a lot of information, and you don't need to digest it all. You know, yes, you need to sift through you know, I would highly recommend some podcasts. The reason being, it's one of my favorite mediums to consume information just because I can do other stuff. Uh, I don't mind articles. You know, I, I am subscribed to some newsletters. Uh, but just personally, I'm able to sift through a lot of information and correlate through podcasts. And that's just what works for me personally. You know, and it's not, I'm not trying to dive into these podcasts to learn something or like, you know, uh, find the perfect idea that's going to help me, you know, uh, win a lot it's more like a puzzle and you know each little bit illuminates a part of the board and you sim you're simply piecing it together and then you have the technical you put all that together like we talk about every week guys so this was a quick overview of the book great depression winners and losers in a post pandemic world and let me actually it's the new great depression i don't know if i put that out there and it's by james rickards Great book overall. I would just, you know, when I do, um, I don't know if any of you guys have Goodreads. It's the app that I use to save all my books that I read and write reviews. Um, I'm definitely going to post on it at the first first uh, part of the book. Like, the first half of the book is just kind of repetitive. And, you know, I didn't enjoy it that much. But the next book, who he's diving into some great stuff. 
You know, I believe he has 50 plus years worth of experience in the market. So, I mean, you got to respect experience, guys. Got to respect experience. You know, and that's what I get on here to talk and share with you guys about is my experience, not what I believe is right, you know, and not to tell you what to do, but this is simply about, you know, sharing what's worked for me. And, you know, a lot of these points resonated from experience. I'm not speaking theoretical. You know, the whole point about being nimble, like I shared with you guys about um, porch, that was that was experience. Like I got into the trade, I made that 30%, and now I decided to step back and wait to re-enter the trade, you know? That person, the, the two examples, the person who made 11000 and the person who made 5000 you know, why did the person make 11000 Because they was nimble. They took the money that was offered to them, they got out, they was patient, they did, they, they did their market forecast, their sentiment, they, they pieced it all together, they was convicted in their trade, and they executed you know, it's so many moving parts to trading, guys, and I feel like that's why people fail is because there's so many moving parts, and most people, they get on, they want a secret algorithm or system, and, you know, it's so much that goes into it emotionally, psych psychologically, mentally, you know, preparationally, if that's a word, you know, all of that, it's trading is a moving dynamic system, and it's also a changing, changing system, it's not rigid, you know, it's changing, and you have to be nimble. And it's not for the meek at all or weak. And when I say weak, I don't mean weak as in someone who can't do it, but someone who isn't willing to put in the work. You know, it takes work and the experience is where the key is. The gold is in your experience. The losing trades, the winning trades, it's all in there, guys. You know, I was today uh, I was with the family. who was at church and I'll conclude today's message with this. But it was simply this. It was powerful and it correlates to this to the message we're talking about it was simply that when you're happy or not when, when everything's going good if you don't give praise then you'll become prideful because you'll believe that everything is coming from you and not the circumstances and the, all the moving parts of life you know from the people around you to the inanimate things around you that's all affecting what you're experiencing you know we're not an isolated island and so um yeah when if you don't give praise then you'll become prideful and think that everything's coming from you. And then the second part is, if you don't give praise when everything's going wrong, you'll get locked in a cell of depression. And the reason why that correlates to what we're saying is, you have to be, you you have to be open, and see that the gold is in the experience. And you also have to, you know, you you have to, you know, I'm not saying you have to give praise. And now I'm kind of losing how it was correlating, but it was good. That was good. I guess, oh, that's what it was, trading. I mean, uh, as far as being in the market. So if you're winning, right, I've experienced this. I win a couple of trades. I'm up like, you know, 5 10% on the account as a whole. And it's like, oh, I'm man, I did great. Look at I did, right? And then I'm brought right back down to reality because the trade is not, um, I, I just, I'm, I'm not executing my plan. I think that I'm untouchable. Look at I did. Right. And then it's like the opposite end of that spectrum is when I'm losing five to 10 trades, I'm down five to 10, 15 percent on the account as a whole. And I'm like, oh, my God, why? I shouldn't even trade anymore. What the hell is it? It's fuck trading, man. It's like you see those two huge swings that are never. That's another thing. Uh, that's the emotional piece. Why people don't make it in trading because those two pieces right there. And so you can alleviate that by not focusing on the results, but focusing on the process. And so giving praise to the process, giving you your, your praise and your focus to the process of what you're learning, whether you, you're up or you're down, you're appreciating, okay, this is why that happened. You know, the other day, I was like I was telling you guys with um, the peso, you know, that was down a huge, that and um, Great Britain pound, the, the pound and the dollar, you know, they both dropped tremendously, like over you know, 100 pips, and it's because of a piece of information that came out. I was, I didn't do my due diligence as far as um, being aware of the CPI that came out, right, the jobs reports, and you know what, guess what, um, and I, I believe it's the consumer price index, but I don't know why, but, you know, some of the podcast and mediums that I was getting some information from, it seemed like there, it was all correlated, but anywho, the point is, I learned a lot from those two trades that, okay, I didn't do my market analysis. I didn't do my sentiment. I didn't put that out there. And and I learned so much from that. And so that's what I'm saying, guys. If I would have just focused on the results, I would have been like, oh, I lost money. Damn. Okay. 
Oh, man, let me try something else. Not seeing the gold that's within that. You know, it's I've, I've recorded 300-some-odd trades, guys, and I'm still not where I want to be at all. 300, it's, I think it's going on 305 to be exact, right? 305 trades. And from recording all those, you know, it's like I, I, I can look back and see the gold that was in them. Don't focus on the results, guys. Don't focus on results. I feel like this is done turning into a motivational podcast. Hot damn, it's 25 minutes, guys. But you know what? You guys bring it out of me, man. And if you gotten this far, you are truly, you are truly zoned in. And just know that you're hungry. I can feel it. I'm speaking because I'm there with you. I'm hungry too. But you know what? I'm patient. And I'm planting seeds. I don't want to go out and become gluttonously fat. I don't want to gluttonously ravage down today's food and eat so much today that I can barely move tomorrow and have to do it all again in two days. I'd much rather plant five seeds, get up tomorrow hungry as hell, you know, plant another two seeds, eat just a little bit to satiate me, to get me, to keep me moving. But I didn't plant those seeds, guys. We're planting seeds, man. We're farmers. Let's heal the land. Y'all give me, not land. Yeah, I'm speaking from um, a land synergy podcast. I mean, even though that's, yes, definitely we're healing the land. If you're into healing the land, self-sufficiency as far as, you know, being able to fend for yourself and whatnot, growing your own food, check out land synergy. Uh, But that, as far as uh, macronomics, guys, it starts with planting the seeds of experience. You have gold in front of you. You have gold in front of you. But guess what? It's hidden. It's hidden. You have to go through the experience to unlock it. The gold is in your experience. And I'll conclude with this, guys. Would you rather have a fish and eat today or learn how to fish? Would you rather make $1,000 in the market today but not know how to do it tomorrow? Or would you rather learn how to make $50 today and be able to replicate it tomorrow? Your choice says a lot about where you're at. And guess what, guys? I'm one of those people that that would say, hell, I'll take that $1,000. Because some people need it. Hell, I need it. I'll use it. Poo, what? But guess what? If you're in the market because you're hurting, you're already down, guys. I don't just depend on trading. Got many other endeavors and things I'm building. If I was just trading, which I tried before, man, guys, it's too stressful. You can't put you you can't put it all on the market. You got to be patient. And so, with that, guys, do you want the fish, or do you want to learn how to fish? <laughs>